Hi, everybody. My name's Lee. I'm a grateful Al Anon. I live in Rogersville, Tennessee, and I attend uh, regularly uh, three separate groups. I, I attend the Voices with Choices group in Kingsport. I attend the Serenity group in Morristown, and I attend the Strength in Numbers group in Morristown. One of my favorite authors um, is Thomas Merton, great spiritual writer. And one of the things Thomas Merton once wrote was that we don't need so much to talk about God, but to allow people to feel how God lives within us. And that really hit home with me. So when I was doing some praying and meditating and questioning God about what might be my purpose up here today, um, it became pretty clear that over time, I didn't need so much to talk to you about my recovery and about my step work, so much as I felt the need to allow you to feel how I feel the steps. Like most of us, I guess, I started my step work as a function of my brain, right? Because I needed to be able to read them, understand them, and process them intellectually. And that got me pretty far. It got me into a, a working knowledge of the steps, and it got me into what I call the beginnings of my emotional sobriety. And that was really, really helpful. And then somewhere along the line, I, I, uh, I started doing some uh, feelings work because one of my sponsors said, you know, you don't really feel very well, do you? I said, I feel fine. He said, no, no. <laughs> he said, you don't feel well. And so I did some work on feelings, and then I realized that when I learned how to feel the steps, not just know them, but feel the steps from the inside of each step, my recovery sort of took off in this entirely new blessed direction uh, where life just became more meaningful and the people who used to bother me so much somehow became less bothersome and I couldn't figure out how I changed them. Uh, <laughs> and so that's my goal today, to try to help you um, open, for me to open myself up to how I feel about the steps, how I feel the steps from the inside and invite you, if you like, to access those same feelings that I feel. The rest is up to God, right? So let's get started. Uh, step one, right? We admitted we were powerless. And like I said, um, I started my step one work um, all in my head, right? Because I, I, my project in my life prior to recovery was my alcoholic and addicted son. And like I just said, he was my project. And I knew that if I could just find the right combination of love and skills and punishment and regulation and management, he'd be all right. And of course, I had no concept of what powerlessness meant to my head even. I certainly had no concept of what powerlessness felt like. And so I came into Al-Anon as a failure <laughs> My son's definition, not mine. A failure as a dad. <laughs> and I felt that failure myself because, of course, I couldn't fix. I couldn't control. I couldn't even understand not only my son, not only his disease. I couldn't even fix, control, or understand Lee. And that really hit me because I'd always thought pretty highly of myself prior to that. And to realize that I was a powerless individual, first in my head, and then to come to terms with the fact that I was a powerless individual, then in my heart, um, was a really, really humbling discovery. The way I learned to feel the steps is mostly through music and mostly through, um, honestly, Broadway plays, because I love Broadway plays. And once in a while, a song will get sung from the stage of a Broadway play, and I'll, it'll just hit me right there, and I'll say, that's it. You know, that's step one for me, or whatever, you know. And there, uh, one of the plays I, I, I uh, was early uh, attracted to is the play Les Miserables. And there's a song in that play, I Dreamed a Dream, that's entirely moving about powerlessness. But the last part of that song, 
spoke to me about my feelings. And it said, I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living, so different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. I couldn't believe that it happened to me. And so I walked into Al-Anon, and they just said, what's new? <laughs> I was so special up to that point, and I realized literally that every single one of us in this room today, Al-Anons and alcoholics alike, had come into this program being able to sing that same song, how life killed the dreams that we dreamed once we realized that we were not in control. And once again, that powerlessness moved from my head because when it was only in my head, I only dabbled in powerlessness. <laughs> I used it when I had to, but when I didn't have to, forget it. But once that powerlessness sunk into my heart, once I could see powerlessness from the inside of step one, then I saw powerlessness not so much as an obstacle to my life, but as a gift. Because I remember saying in one of my first Al-Anon meetings how much I hated being powerless. And I did. And then somehow over the course of my step work, I, I started to realize that powerlessness was not an obstacle to my growth. It was not an obstacle to living a good life. In fact, it was the gift that I didn't know I needed all along. But powerlessness to me was complete darkness, and so what I needed to do was continue my step work past step one and find some type of higher power that could say in the middle of this darkness, let there be light. And that's why I'm so appreciative to this morning's speaker, Sheldon, on steps one and two. Um, because once again, he allowed me to see how alike our recoveries feel, whether we're Al-Anons or whether we're alcoholics. I think sometimes most of us tend to think we're so different, yet our disease is so much alike. And the feelings that we have to process in our diseases are not just alike, they're identical when it comes to the step work and the healing. So I got to step two, right? This, this higher power thing came to believe, and the part I liked best was, could restore me to sanity. Because I really had come to realize that I was nuts. And so what step two offered me, in terms of my higher power, my first sponsor was quick to say, the God of your understanding, Lee, is not Santa Claus. The God of your understanding comes to you in step two in terms of a sanity clause. <laughs> a little bit different. And so I pictured myself searching for this God that I had never found before, because everywhere I'd been before, in my own religion that I was raised in, in the other religious institutions that I visited, in Eastern religions that I would try to read books on and practice, I found God in a box. And there's nothing wrong with God in a box if that's what works for any of us. But this God in a box, for some reason, always escaped what I needed in a higher power. And so my sponsor said, why are you restricting yourself to God in a box, for God's sake? If that works fine for other people, that's cool. But God does not come in a box because every time, Lee, you try to box God, God proves to you that God cannot fit in that kind of a box. So keep it simple, dude. What do you want in God? And I realized I wanted basically at least to start just two things. I wanted unconditional friendship for my higher power. And I wanted something that had eluded me from human beings. I wanted perfect love. Because I kept asking human beings for perfect love, and they could not deliver. And I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> because they're not God. And so there are two songs that open me up to the feelings of step two in terms of friendship and in terms of love. And even though I couldn't hear God singing those words originally, um, like Bob said, if you can't believe that God exists out there, then put your higher power.
power in that chair. So if I couldn't believe that God could sing these words directly to me, then I just listened to James Taylor. <laughs> Friend, when you're down and troubled and you need some loving care and nothing, oh, nothing is going right, call my name and think of me and soon I will be there to brighten up even your darkest night. You just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. James Taylor. And then before long, it wasn't James singing those words to me. Somehow it was this other voice that became my higher power. And then I realized, you know how God comes to me? Richard Rohr writes this in, in his books. God comes to me disguised as my life. In this case, it was James Taylor. So that was the God of my friendship. How did I find the God of love? It came from this other Broadway play, La Cage of Full. The, the song originally sung was Look Over There, but I changed the words a little bit, and it goes something like this. How often is someone concerned with the tiniest threads of your life? Concerned with whatever you feel and whatever you touch. Look deep in here. Feel deep in here. Know that I care that much. So count all the loves who will love you from now till the end of your life. And when you have added the loves who have loved you before, look deep in here, feel deep in here, know that I love you more. A drag queen sang those words. <laughs> God came to me through the words of a drag queen singing about love. <laughs> Step three. Made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood God. I went back to Richard Rohr, who's one of my favorite authors, and Richard Rohr describes the concept of a divine gaze. And I picture the inside of step three as God inviting me into this room with giant picture windows that look out on life, on my life. And out this picture window, I can see all of the pains in the ass that I know. <laughs> and they're not pains in the ass when I look through this window. I say, how do you do this? He says, it's called the divine gaze. He said, they're still doing what they're doing, okay? But you can sort of see it like I see it. And look down there, Lee, there's you. And you hear what that person next to you is saying? He's calling you a pain in the ass <laughs> because he can't see you the way I see you either. And this life situation that's keeping you awake at, not, at night and tearing you apart, see it the way I see it as your classroom of recovery and stop fighting life, and stop fighting the people who won't be the way you want them to be. That's what recovery is about. That's why I came to you as friendship and as love, so that you can then return the gaze to others and to your life as best you can today as friendship and love. Try it. So I tried doing that. And sure enough, you know what? I realized that my life did become, at first only little bits, but gradually more peaceful, more livable. And like I said earlier, the people who were such pains in the butt miraculously changed. Hmm, just amazed me. So the way I get into the feelings of step three is through a quick song from My Fair Lady. It started out on the street where you live. Again, I changed the words on the street where God lives. I've often walked down this street before, and the pavement sometimes stays beneath my feet before. All at once am I several stories high. 
Knowing I walk the streets where God lives, folks are still the same. They don't bother me as much. <laughs> For there's no place else on earth that I would rather be. Let the time go by. I don't care if I can be here on these streets where God lives. That's the divine gaze. And when I try to look at life and people and myself through the eyes of God, through the eyes of the divine gaze, life becomes a whole lot easier and a whole lot happier and a whole lot more peaceful. But I have to be willing to feel it in order to make it real for me. Step four. Now this is a step that really deals with feelings, right? Because we stay away from step four because it feels scary. Making that searching and fearless moral inventory. Because inside of step four, I'm asked to intentionally, not accidentally, but intentionally go into the inside of this step and struggle with what the steps call, you know, character flaws, character defects. And yeah, we'll add a few assets for good measure, but we know what this is about. <laughs> this is about our crap. Okay? And now step four asks me to go inside of there and intentionally deal with my contradictions, with my confusions, with my resentments, with my struggles and need to control, with my unwillingness to use the divine gaze in looking at life. They want me to do this on purpose? Okay. There's a brand new Broadway play out called Dear Evan Hansen. Fantastic play. And, and um, there's a song from that play that describes to me so beautifully the feelings I feel when I'm inside of step four. I hope you can identify with these feelings. And step four might not become quite as scary for you. It's called words fail. Words fail. Words fail. There's so little to defend. You know, Sometimes you see what you think that you want. Sometimes you see, al who you think you should be. And it's right there, right there, right there in front of you. And you want to believe it's true. So you make it true. And you honestly believe that somebody wants you this way. And you honestly believe that somebody needs you to be this way, too. This was all a sad invention. It wasn't real, I know. But it seemed to work pretty well for a while. I guess I couldn't let that go. I guess I couldn't give that up. I guess I wanted to believe. Because if I just believed, then I never had to see what was really there. No. No, I'd rather just pretend I'm something better than these broken parts. Pretend I'm something other than this mess that I am. Because if I just pretend, then I don't have to look at it. And no one gets to look at it. No. No one can really see, because what if they saw? What if everyone knew? Could they like what they saw? Would they love who they saw? Or would they hate him too? All I've ever done is run. And now, step four invites me to step into the sun. Wow. Here is a way to use all of my character defects to intentionally go into that struggle and come out in sunshine if I was only willing to feel the feelings all the way through and stop pretending that my shadows didn't exist. That takes takes a lot of faith on my part, even to this day, and it takes a lot of willingness to feel. Step five. 
admit it to God, to ourselves, to, to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So in step five, I picture myself in a room with three chairs. I'm sitting in one, God's sitting in another one, and this other person that I'm going to, that I'm going to admit all my stuff to is sitting in that third chair. And I'm getting ready to share, right, what I learned in step four. But first, this other human being reminds me, Lee, remember this. God doesn't love you if you change. That's that God in the box stuff that somebody else sells. God loves you, Lee, so that you can change. Huge difference. So for me, step five is not primarily about the stuff I'm going to spill out of my mouth about my shortcomings. Step five is about my finally becoming willing to share Lee, who stayed hidden away. Because why? Because I hated him so much. And I couldn't possibly share that with you because you might not like me and you certainly wouldn't love me. And step five reminded me, I will never be able to hate myself into a new version of me that I could expect to love. Yet for all my life, that's what I tried doing. Taking it one, further, one step further, I could never hate another person into a new version of him or her that I could expect to one day like. One step further, how is it possible for me to ever hate my life into a new version of it that would make me like it. And so step five said, stop all that foolishness, just sit down and share Lee and feel the birth of change in yourself. And so this is what step five feels like. It's from the Broadway play Dream Girls. It's the birth of change called I Am Changing. <clears throat> I sit there, God, this other human being, and I simply say, Look at me, look at me, I am changing, I'm seeing everything so clear, I am changing, and I can start right now, right here, I'm hoping to work it out. And I know that I can, here it is, but I need you, <laughs> I need a hand. All my life I've been such a fool, saying I could do this all on my own. How many good friends have I already lost? How many dark nights have I known? Walking down all these wrong roads, there was nothing there for me to find. All these years of darkness had made this person blind, but now I see I am changing. I can get my life together now. <laughs> I am changing. And I finally know how, you see. I can start again. I can leave my past behind. Who the hell knew? Nobody ever told me I could leave my past behind. I'll change my life. My steps show how. And nothing has to stop me now. Step five. All that fear resulted in the birth of the realization that I'm changing. Step six. The most mumbled step of the 12 in every meeting I've ever been to. Person staying step six. Become a little what the hell does that mean? And that's where I stayed with it for as long as I had to. And then I started realizing a little bit more about feelings, and I realized step six is one of these steps. Your head thinks about step six. You intellectualize step six. You never know what that means. How do you know when you're entirely ready? And that's because step six, to me, is one of those steps. That's what I call a heart step. Readiness is something that is felt. It is not something that's easily known for me. So the inside of step six asks me to feel what Richard Rohr calls beginner's mind 
and beginner's heart, because I've never been here before. If I'd been here before, I wouldn't have to be ready. I already knew it. Beginner's mind and beginner's heart says, I don't really know what comes next, but I'm here, and I'm willing to become entirely ready and to feel it. There's a song from a fantastic play called Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. The song is called Dust and Ashes. It's sung by an alcoholic character, okay? So you alcoholics can perhaps understand these feelings, but we al -Anon certainly can also. It describes the process that I feel I went through in getting ready to become entirely ready. Dust and Ashes. Is this how I die? Ridiculed and laughed at, wearing clown shoes. Is this how I die? Pretending and preposterous, sick from booze. How did I live? Was I kind enough, good enough? Did I love enough? I taste every wasted minute, every time I turned away from the things that could have healed me. All of my life I spent searching the words of poets and saints and prophets and kings. And now that I'm here in step six, all I know that I've learned is that all that I know is I don't know a thing. Be beginner's mind. So easy to close off, place the blame outside, hiding in my room at night so terrified, all the things I could have been, but I never had the nerve, feeling life and love I don't deserve. Is this how I die? Is there any other way my life can be? Is this how I die? Such a storm of feelings inside of me. So this is why I'm shaky and this is why I'm scared. Oh God, is there something that I missed? Did I squander my divinity? Has happiness been within me the whole time? Oh, how long have I been sleeping? They say we are asleep until we fall in love with life. There it is. And I'm so ready to wake up now. I want to wake up. Please help me wake up. Dear God, please help me die to why I'm like this. I'm ready, so, so ready to wake up. Can you feel the difference between that readiness and Ben Tom, ready to have government all this stuff? Step seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. You know, inside this step, I feel that what I'm actually praying for is for a living relationship, not to really get things done. This is actually the discovery of my true self in relationship to God, who comes disguised as my life, right? And because God comes disguised as my life, and you are part of my life, then God comes disguised as you. And that's where the rubber hits the road for me in step seven. If I can remember that the shortcomings will be removed, yes, by the power of God, but it's God who sits there and there and there and there reminding me, this is where the rubber meets the road, dude, and we're God in your life today, like it or not, right? And so this song, what I, the song that I want to talk about here, what step seven really tells me is, I humbly ask God for the color purple. And I started thinking about that song, The Color Purple, from the play of the same name. The song asks, the color purple, where do it come from? And I realized color purple comes from red and blue. And I know about red and blue because red is the color of one of my passions. It's my power. It's my anger. It's my control. And when I'm red, I'm red hot. Or at least I think so. 
but I'm isolated. I'm alone, because I won't let anybody near me when I'm red. And when I'm blue, it sounds exactly what it says, right? I'm also isolated there, but I'm depressed, I'm a victim, and I'm isolated in my hopelessness and despair. Red, I'm isolated. Blue, I'm isolated. And then I remember, Lee, isolation is the dark room where you develop your negatives. And so God says to me in step seven, how about we take that red and we take that blue and we merge it together into something that we like to call compassion, relationship with your life, relationship with the people who sit across from you at the tables, relationship with your sponsor, relationship with every situation in your life. Color purple. It's a metaphorical song, so the color purple is going to say something like, God is a honeybee. And sure, God is a honeybee. But metaphorically speaking, as, as this song gets sung, I'd like you to picture who the honeybees are in your life. What do honeybees do? They pollinate. Who are the people in your life that pollinate your recovery creativity? Honeybees also sting. Who are the people in life that aren't afraid to sting you a little bit when you want to go back into the isolation of your reds and your blues? The song says God's a waterfall. Most groups have a waterfall, man or woman. They seem to be able to just gush forth this friendship and this love and this recovery stuff, and you wonder, where in the hell does it come from, right? Way, way up in the hills somewhere. And so that's what this song is about, the color purple. <clears throat> God is inside of me <laughs> and everyone who ever was and ever will be. And when I finally looked inside, I found it rising like the sun, this hope that sets me free. God's that first blade of corn. God is a honey bee. God is a waterfall, that's all God to me. God is the color purple, where do it come from? Now my eyes are open, I see what God has done. God is the grain of love that grows the mighty tree. God is the smallest voice that sings in harmony. God is the drops of water that keep the rivers high. God is the miracles in store for you and I. God is the color purple. Where do it come from? Now my eyes are open. I see what God has done. That's how it feels to me. Step eight. Made that list of all persons we'd harmed. Inside step eight, I feel four words. Hurt people, hurt people. If I've been hurt, guess what? I hurt, and I hurt others. I saw a play called Miss Saigon, which is about the Vietnam War, and there's a song in that play called Bui Doi, B-U-I-D-O-I, translated as The Dust of Life. The song's about 30,000 babies born during the Vietnam War, American GIs, Vietnamese women, these babies were conceived out of one night stands, they were conceived from rape, they were conceived from prostitution, and some were conceived through very beautiful love affairs. But at the end of the Vietnam War, of these 30,000 babies, 10,000 were brought back to the U.S., 20,000 were left in Vietnam where they would be no acceptance of them whatsoever because they were the dust of life. So that's what this song was written about. And then it occurred to me how much this applies to step eight because the harms I have done to other people on, me, on this list, they were my bui doi. Listen to this song, it's very short. Think of the harms you've done, let it feel. They're called bui doi. The dust of life, conceived in our hell, and born in 
our strife. These harms are the living reminders of the good we failed to do. That's why we can't forget them, must not forget them. We birthed these children. These are our children, too. Guidoi. Step nine, made direct amends whenever possible. Real easy song for this one. All step nine really wants to make me feel is that I have the power within my own actions in making amends to free myself from the shame of these terrible harms that were conceived in my own hell and born in my own strife. From the musical Godspell, this song is called Beautiful City. Out of the ruins and rubble, out of the mess we made, out of our nights of struggle, can we allow our shame to fade? We may not reach the ending, but we can start slowly and surely amending brick by brick, heart by heart. We can build a beautiful city if we each just do our part. We can build this beautiful city that's no city of angels, but we can build a city of heart. Step 10. Continue to take personal inventory when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. You know, nothing much changes overnight except the start of a brand new day when we're given another shot. That's why it's called progress, not perfection, right? And without taking this inventory on a regular basis, I try to do it daily. How will I know that my next shot will deliver better performance, better progress than my last shot did unless I inventory it? And so for me, that 10-step inventory is about an examination of conscience, sure. But it's also about an examination of my consciousness. A couple of differences, right? Situation. Came home. You wouldn't believe I was in the middle of so many stupid people today. There were stupid drivers. There were stupid food store employees. There were stupid people everywhere. And I couldn't help myself, so I kind of joined the stupid crowd. And I'll do better tomorrow. That's an examination of conscience. An examination of consciousness looks at that same exact behavior and asks a little bit different question about these stupid people. Why did you assume you're the smartest in the room? And then I looked at this other situation where she knew if she did what she did, I was going to be really PO'd. And guess what? She did it. And so I got my resentment. I'll do better tomorrow. That's an examination of conscience. An examination of consciousness looks at that situation and says, why do you resent when you don't know her intent? And the third one. Everybody was crazy today, just like it shows on the news every night. Everybody was crazy. And so I had no, jo no choice but to join the crazy, and I threw the fit that was the time of my life, but I'll do better tomorrow. An examination of consciousness asks just a little bit different question of that same situation. Why'd you throw that fit when you really don't know squat? So there's a play called Hamilton, and this play is written by Lin-Manuel Lin -Manuel Miranda, and I don't, I'm not sure if it's hip-hop or rap, and I'm a 70-year-old white dude. <clears throat> but there's a song in this play called I Am Not Throwing Away My Shot, which describes the feelings of step 10 for me personal, uh, beautifully. So I'm going to try either hip-hop or rap. It's very short. The pain will be over quickly, I promise. <laughs> Well, I am not throwing away my shot. No, hell no, I'm not throwing away my shot. Why not? Because I love my recovery. It gives me self-discovery, so I don't throw away my shot. So every night I'm going to size up, so in the morning I can rise up, because when I work step 10, I'll get another shot, and then, and then I won't throw away my shot. That's all.
I'll keep my day job. <laughs> Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. This is a big one for me. Inside step 11, I actually feel, in my heart, conscious contact with God. And I didn't know how to do that until I was watching again this play Les Miserables. And there's a song from one of the characters who's praying to God to bring this young man home, who he, who he considers a son. And of course, because my son was dealing with addiction and alcoholism, I heard the words to this prayer from the stage, and I thought, that's it. That's conscious contact with God for me. So that was the prayer that I learned from that stage. And then from an entirely different play, Into the Woods, I heard God's answer to that prayer. So I'm going to do two quick songs, the prayer to God, bring him home, God's answer to me. Children will listen. The prayer. God on high, hear my prayer. In my need, you have always been there. He is young, he's so afraid. Let him rest, heaven blessed. Bring him home. Bring him home. Bring my son home. You can take, you can give all I ask. Just show us how to live. Bring him peace. Bring him joy. Bring him love. He is only a boy. If I die, let me die. Let him live. God on high, bring him home. Bring him home. And God's answer. Sometimes people leave you halfway through the wood. Sometimes they deceive you. Keep looking for the good. People make mistakes, unfortunate mistakes, believing they're alone. But Lee, you are not alone. No one is alone. That is conscious contact with God for me. And as you, can, you could probably infer, my son did not survive his battle with addiction and alcoholism. He died on July 19, 2016. And when I got word of his death, all I knew to do was to try my best to establish conscious contact with God as I learned to feel it in step 11. And it happened. And do you know what else happened when I established conscious contact with God from working step 11? At that same exact time, I felt the powerlessness of step one. At that same exact moment, I felt the deepest love and the deepest friendship of my higher power embracing me that I, just, that I felt in step two. At that same exact time, I knew I had to employ the divine gaze of step three in order to get through this latest death blow. At that same exact time, I can remember my inventory of steps four and five and how important it was that I brought myself out of the shadows and into the sun because life needed me right now as much as I needed you. At that same exact time, I felt the beginner's mind of step six because I'd never been there before dealing with my own son's death from this disease. I felt the color purple of step seven. 
I felt the memory of my amends to my son in steps eight and nine, and I was so thankful that I had the opportunity to work those steps and make amends to my son while I was able. And I felt the importance of the next shot of step 10, knowing that I didn't want to throw away this next shot. And I was taking my inventory on the spot to make sure I could be the best possible dad to the son that remained, the best possible role model. And guess what? You were there the entire time to help me steer myself to that next shot. You came to me disguised as God during those days following my son's death. Thank you so much, gods. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening. The most profound spiritual awakening I've gotten from my step work and my recovery is simple. God has a human heart. When you think about it, God would almost have to have a human heart if God is friendship and love, human qualities, the way I define it. That's the way God comes to us, disguised as our lives, as human hearts. This song, to close out step 12, is from the Broadway play Once on This Island. It's called The Human Heart. The courage of each one of us the craziness of youth, the failures and the foolishness which led us to this truth, the hopes that make us happy and the dreams that won't come true and all the love that ever was now waits inside of you. Because you're part, part of God's human heart. You're now part. You're part of God's human heart. For all who take this journey and manage to endure. For those who stay with questions still, yet learn to feel secure. Those who came before us and millions still to come and those who we will teach this to and those we learned it from we're all part we're part of God's human heart you see from the start God's had a human heart and your heart in step 12 is simply part of God's human heart. In closing, my step work has taught me basically one simple rule. Pursue healthy love. Learn what it feels like to be able to love healthily. Learn what it feels like to love Lee in a healthy way, to love other people in a healthy way, to love God in a healthy way, and to love life in a healthy way. It's so ironic to me that this is what our dogs do naturally. <laughs> One of God's little tricks, huh? So... We kiss today goodbye, its sweetness and its sorrow. Wish me luck, the same to you. And I can't regret what I did for love, what I do for love. All we can do is try these steps are ours to borrow. It's as if we always knew that we won't forget what we did for love, what we do with love. Gone love is never gone, 
As we travel on, love's what we'll remember. So we kiss each day goodbye, and we walk towards each tomorrow. We'll do what we're called to do. We won't forget, can't regret, what we do for love. What we do for love. Thank you so much for your time and attention.